Hi, this is Alex Trompelar from AIGameDev.com. Today I'd like to share with you some hard-earned insights that we've discovered over the past 8 to 10 months whilst building the AI sandbox. To do that, I'm going to take you through some of the sandbox samples that are available uh, when you compile it and uh, run it. I won't go through all of the samples because I've showed you some before. I'm going to go through some of the most important ones. I'm going to start uh, with the first the test framework, actually. This is uh, uh, the first important insight. I've used the test framework before, and I built it as a, a key element uh, as part of the, the sandbox itself. And that allowed us to run all the automated tests, uh, unit tests after each compile, and functional test after each check-in. And it also handles the sample menu as well. So we have this interactive uh, menu selection system that allows you to run tests uh, selectively, hierarchically. Uh, but as well, on top of that, you can run them directly from Visual Studio or from the command line without having to select uh, items interactively. So that was a big win for us. Uh, would definitely recommend it to anyone to have this system that really reduces turnaround times. Uh, a good example I want to show you is the motion graph sample number five, for instance. Uh, what's special about this sample is, first of all, it loads really quickly and it was designed to load really quickly, so that really emphasizes the fast iteration times. Uh, I've shown you the motion graph sample before, so this guy's playing a random motion graph. What's uh, changed or what's special about this particular demo is the um, uh, motions that go into the motion graph. Uh, and that was another insight that we discovered recently, how easy it is to segment and partition motions into steps using very simple minima detection. So we just plot the position of the feet and we uh, look at it as a graph of height versus time and then the minima we extract them and filter out some uh, noisy results. And this is what we use as the basis of the motion graph. So we have left to right steps and vice versa on the other side. And so when we build the motion graph we are alternating between a uh, motion from this side uh, and then picking a motion from the other side. And that gives you the basic structure of the motion graph. And what we're building on top of that is a, a locomotion layer that selects the best quality motions based on what you want to do, like move to a target point or face a particular direction. And we're experimenting with a variety of different ways to do that, including behavior trees and uh, A star planners. Here is a, another example of a, a bigger motion graph. So you can see here the extraction of the steps is also found. Uh, this guy here, uh, a short step, so it works relatively robustly. It requires a little bit of tweaking to find the, the foot plant minima and then extracting gates from that, steps from that, but it works very well once you have it in place. But I'd like to go into animations a little bit more, so in particular uh, mirroring animations. This is a running motion capture. The red is the original and the orange is the mirrored version. So in the past, what I've done is I've used mirroring as a tool for creating an extra animation that you can use in your pipeline. What we're doing now is doing all the mirroring at runtime and it's uh, computationally feasible and in fact, it's very fast. So that's one uh, insight that we discovered. So we developed this sample to test the mirroring uh, so you can check that around this middle line here, everything is perfectly symmetrical. We have the ability to control time and slow down and uh, accelerate, rewind, and that's very useful for checking the quality of the motions. We also have uh, a few action animations. Now these have been available in the sandbox for a while now, um, but these have not been used yet. We've been focusing on the locomotion. What we're building at the moment is a uh, running prototype, like a free-running parkour demo where the guys race around a, a world and try and reach waypoints in the world. And what we're going to do is introduce random obstacles and dynamically moving objects that require jumping over. And these are basically different jumping motions, this one with two feet. Uh, all these motions are in fact available uh, freely on the web and that was another uh, insight. We looked a long time to find good quality motions on the web and there are a few. Uh, but not uh, that many comprehensive databases, but the one we found was the CMU mocap database. And that is an also a very big database. It's got lots of motions. <clears throat> some of them are not quite as good quality as the others, um, but if you look through them, you will find some good quality stuff. And all of these motions had to still be post-processed, so we had to hire an artist to make sure that the feet were relatively clean uh, for this running motion. 
for instance. So we spend a lot of time on that to make sure that there were no artifacts of the import. Because um, with motion capture you still have to clean them up afterwards. So that covers all the animation motions. You can basically get these by default. If you just compile and run the sandbox, you can literally just call play animation and it will uh, give you these animations. So we've uh, gone through the whole process of cleaning them up and exporting them so you can play around with them without much hassle at all. The next uh, test I wanted to show you first is the uh, shortest path. So this is an A star prototype. Uh, what's useful about this is that uh, yeah we display the search itself as it's running so it's useful for checking how inefficient A star is and in general you'll find that uh, A star does have to search a lot of space to be able to find optimal paths that's the way A star works you can drag the search in a way uh, from the source to the destination by t tweaking the heuristic but you're uh, improving the best case performance at the cost of the average case so it, it, sometimes it might end up being worse for you by tweaking the heuristic like this. Um, of course, in other situations, it's much more optimal. That's the nature of A star. When, when you have good special cases, it works out well. So one big insight here is that uh, having this uh, visualization of the search is very useful for uh, understanding what's going on at the low level. It's also important to see how slow uh, your search is by checking how many nodes are actually expanded so if you could have this debug information available uh, it's very useful to have at runtime as well to see exactly why your performance is is not quite as good as you expected it to be we're reusing a star in fact for uh, the high level um, search and this is a, another example uh, of counter-strike map and the high level search is essentially based on these areas and i'll show you how these are generated in a few minutes but the thing that uh, shocked me the most is the quality of the paths within uh, certain areas. Um, it can require cleaning up the paths because you end up with uh, jagged, um, let's say, corners, and this requires post-processing. And it, in fact, the hierarchical search is not optimal, but it's only uh, three or four percent of the cases will it be really suboptimal once you've smoothed your paths. But first I'd like to show you how exactly these uh, levels of generated of how the areas are generated that's a big part of the equation and this is what we call the, the clustering or the area generation prototype i'm going to show you a smaller level first this is a procedurally generated map and we, we decided to create these procedural uh, maps to essentially reveal um, po potential problems and strengths with uh, particular heuristics and in this case, what you see is that the areas for the rooms are relatively well identified. So the blue areas here is that this is a room, this is a room. A big part of that was tweaking uh, the heuristics up here on the top left to find a good sensible policy. And a hard, hard learned lesson here in the past, I've uh, had systems where you can't really tweak things interactively and see the results, but we've built uh, this editor essentially and that allows you to, to control the size of the area. So if I want to set the maximum size of an area to 64, let's say for tactical reasoning, it makes more sense to, to have areas of the same size, then I'll set the maximum size. For instance, if I want to um, include the travel distance to the center of the area as part of the cost, that will improve the coherence of each area. Of course, this is a procedurally generated map, so by pressing uh, backspace, I can generate new random maps. And you can see the rooms are really well identified, and that's something that we were very happily surprised with. Um, you have to tweak the heuristics correctly, and that's why we've built this menu for you, so you can experiment and see what works with your levels. So this is something we were very proud of, and uh, we're going to be leveraging this more and more as we're moving to combat strategy reasoning in the sandbox over the next few months. And uh, it's a good time to... <laughs> bring everything, all these features together, and we're particularly looking forward to that process. Thanks for listening, and uh, thanks for your time. And if uh, this stuff seems interesting to you, then you should definitely sign up as a member to AIGameDev.com. It's all available for download as soon as you join and sign up, and uh, download the sandbox, and it's just a question of compiling it, and you're up and running.